everyone. Um, just to advise you all that this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. Um, please ensure you switch the microphone on before addressing the committee and remember to switch it off when you finish speaking, otherwise the other microphones won't work. Um, item one on the agenda, apologies for absence. I have received none. Urgent business, there's none. Declarations of interest. Are there any additional declarations of interest? No. Um, in terms of the minutes from the last meeting, I've confirmed with the members of the panel in the last meeting and they're happy for me to sign them. Is that better? Can you still hear? I will try and project a bit more. You haven't missed anything, it's just minutes from the last meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on to why we're all here. Um, members are considering a call-in of a decision taken by the Cabinet Member for Climate Action, Environment and Transport on the 29th of February 2024. Um, please also note that an addendum report has also been published. Members should also note that two separate call-in notices have been received as set out in the report and the constitution provides that they be dealt with together. As members will be aware, we have not been able to hear this within the set time scale because of the two pre-election periods effectively covering the period between the 18th of March to the 4th of July. The procedure we're going to follow tonight is as follows. I'm going to ask the first set of signatories to the call-in to address the subcommittee, and then I'll ask the cabinet member to respond. I'll then ask the second set of signatories to the call-in to address the subcommittee, and ask the cabinet to respond. Ward councillors and any other councillors who wish to address the subcommittee can then each do so for two minutes. Afterwards, I will ask the cabinet members to respond. Um, then we will take a short comfort break so you all know when a break is coming. Um, then we will move on to public speakers. I'd like to note at this point that it is highly unusual for public speakers to address call-ins, particularly this number, but due to the significant public interest in the decision being discussed, I have allowed time for residents who have registered to contribute their views. So members of the public who have registered to speak will be allowed two minutes each. I'll ask first those speaking in favour of the Cabinet Member's decision and then those speaking against its implementation. Afterwards, I'll ask the Cabinet Member if she has any comments on what has been said. Members of the subcommittee can ask questions at any time. For the benefit of everyone, the call-in subcommittee has three options available to it. We can accept the decision allowing immediate implementation. We can send the decision back to the decision maker with comments for reconsideration, or we could refer the decision to full counsel. That is what's set out under the constitution. However, our legal officer has confirmed that this decision does not contradict the budget and policy frameworks as explained in the report. So only options one and two are available this evening. So that's to accept the decision, allowing immediate implementation, or to send the decision back to the decision maker with comments for reconsideration. So, can I invite the first signatory to the call-in to address the subcommittee, and that is Councillor Matt Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me uh, at the back of the room, um, given such a big turnout. Uh, I've called this decision in because I think history is about to repeat itself. I think the Council is going to implement this new low-traffic neighbourhood scheme in Greenwich and Westcombe Park. Uh, cause huge disruption in neighbouring areas in Charlton as a result and end up removing it all at the end of the experimental traffic order. I think, if, I think that's what's going to happen. I think that comes at huge cost in terms of effort, money and the council's reputation with residents too. Um, I feel it's important to stress at the outset that I am not opposed to the principle of low traffic neighbourhoods. In fact, the Cabinet Member knows only too well that I've been lobbying her and the Council for traffic management interventions in my ward in Mottingham and New Eltham for years and years. So for me, this isn't about the principle, um, but it is about whether schemes command public support. I do think that LTN should only be introduced where that majority public support can be demonstrated. And I've proposed before that the council should adopt a principle of public consent to ensure that for both traffic and parking schemes. 
Um, and that principle of public consent, in my view, should apply to a wide area, including neighbouring areas where there are knock-on impacts. So the council chose not to introduce that principle of public consent uh, when I proposed it. And in this example, um, I think it's clear from the consultation responses that there is nothing like um, majority public consent for what is being proposed. And yet the council is pressing ahead anyway. There's huge concerns, as the consultation showed, about these proposals. And I'm also conscious that the amended scheme that the council is uh, bringing forward in this decision. That amended scheme itself hasn't actually been the subject of a specific consultation. So I've called it in today in part, uh, you know, in my role as leader of the opposition, part of my job is to make sure that people with uh, differing views to the council have a chance to have their say. And I think the turnout tonight shows, as you said, very high level of public interest both for and against the scheme. And I felt it was important that everybody uh, who had taken part in that consultation and feels their views have not been listened to have the chance to come tonight and have their say to the cabinet member. Um, and, you know, as you've said as well, there's multiple call-ins tonight and a complex meeting. Um, and I'm also conscious that my fellow, our fellow councillors who represent the wards in question, uh, the subject of their call-in uh, is very much about specific local different aspects of the scheme and they're far better placed than me to speak to those points. My call-in um, is about some of the more fundamental points here, issues of process um, and uh, you know, about how the consultation was carried out, how the responses were interpreted and how the decisions been made. And, I don't represent this area on the council. Um, I spoke, I'm not sure it's an interest chair, but I should declare, I guess, that I, as it happens for 14 years, I've lived uh, first on Delacourt Road and then on Lisbon Street, so I live just outside the proposed scheme area, although I represent a ward at the south of the borough. Um, so uh, it's been called a neighborhood management area. Um, I'm using the word LTN, that's what people, that's the common parlance. I think those uh, terms are interchangeable. Um, I don't think neighbourhood management area is going to stick. So just to clarify, when I talk about LTN, I'm talking about this proposal as a whole. Um, and, you know, it, it's also of strategic significance to the borough. This is a major population centre. Um, and it also has broader implications for the council's wider transport strategy and future schemes elsewhere. So it, just in the interest of time, I'm going to group the issues I've raised into three sort of broad areas, Chair, if, if I may. The first is about the consultation process. So that covers the first two grounds for my call-in, the widespread perception that the consultation was flawed and biased, and secondly, that the, the huge opposition it encountered has been ignored. I've grouped that together, so that's kind of the first bucket, which is about the consultation. The second sort of book it is um, about the fact that not all options have been consulted on. And the third book it is the impact on neighbouring areas and the fact that they haven't been considered. So just to help navigate um, my kind of issues, those are the three areas I want to talk about. So firstly on the consultation, um, I've got some comments and some questions and I'll do that for each of the three areas if I may. So on the consultation, you know, it's just so important when the council consults on anything that it maintains the integrity of that consultation process. You know, whatever the outcome of the decision in question, whether people agree or disagree, people have to have confidence that the decision has been reached uh, after a consultation in which their views were not just taken in a perfunctory manner, but were listened to and considered. And I'm afraid this consultation fell very far short of the mark on that, in that regard. Many residents have been in touch with me as leader of the opposition on the council to say they've had no confidence at all in the consultation process. Um, I've had comments to say the questions in the consultation itself made it difficult to fully express opposition. It, you know, the questions were fairly leading um, and it's all from a position of this scheme is happening and its virtues and benefits. So people felt they weren't able to fully express that opposition. A far sort of more troubling uh, issue for me is that the council didn't remain neutral in the consultation. Um, in fact, the council did what I think was probably the worst possible thing it could have done when it comes to maintaining public confidence in the consultation process by putting out a leaflet um, through residents' letterboxes weeks after the consultation closed advocating the scheme, and I've brought it tonight. This leaflet, um, 
you know, it's kind of ward specific. It looks more like an election campaigning leaflet to me than a, an official council document. It's very campaigny. Um, it extols the virtues of the scheme. It's got headlines like busting the myths. Um, why is the council doing this? Um, why, why was doing nothing not one of the options? Aren't schemes like this bad for business? No, it says with exclamation marks. Um, and so on and so on. And, you know, the fact that this was delivered through letterboxes a matter of weeks after the consultation closed, I'm afraid left residents feeling really shortchanged that the consultation was just a tick box exercise, that they couldn't possibly have read all those responses, and yet they were publicly campaigning the council in favour of the scheme with a, an election style leaflet. I think that was a really big mistake. Um, and I know that the council disputes all this, and in the response to, uh, not the fact of it, but the kind of, you know, my view on what's happened, the council disputes. Um, the answers to my call in on this say repeatedly, the consultations were genuine and extensive listening exercises. Um, but, you know, communication is about sort of giving messages and receiving them, and the way that the consultation was received, um, I'm afraid, show, you know, that it's created the perception of anything but a genuine and extensive listening exercise. And without getting buried in the detail of all this, I just want to say at a high level, just recap what's happened here. The council uh, consulted on various proposals for this scheme. In West Greenwich, 68%, 69%, 70% of respondents uh, expressed negative or very negative opinions of the three options consulted on. In East Greenwich, 79%, 77%, and 73% of respondents expressed negative or very negative opinions on the various options um, put to them. So, and after that, which is a huge level of opposition by any measure, the council is going ahead anyway, regardless, with just a few tweaks to its proposals. So that's something like, you know, seven or eight people out of every 10 in, the, in Western East Greenwich were opposed, and yet the council is still going ahead. And it makes me wonder, you know, what, how high would that figure have to have been for the council to have the humility to listen and think again? You know, would 90% opposition have made them think again? 95%, 100%? I think the truth is there's no percentage figure, no level of opposition that would have led to the council changing its mind about pressing ahead. So that's why I've used the word predetermined. I think this uh, was predetermined. Um, this scheme was going ahead, whatever anybody said in the consultation. And that's, uh, I guess, a fundamental problem that I have. Um, and on the response to my call in tonight, um, it makes the, the council has made the argument that the consultation feedback has influenced the am amended scheme. Um, and I think that's true but I think it's only true in the narrowest of senses. So specific aspects of the scheme have been changed, the hours of operation, the uh, extent of exemptions. But anyone with those fundamental concerns, those 70%, 80% of people who are opposed, have effectively had those concerns disregarded. I asked in my call-in for an update to tables 8.57 and 8.78. These two tables in the kind of huge amount of information before us, I uh, just want to pull these tables out, if I may. So table 8.57 um, is a helpful table in the decision report um, that uh, gives the most common themes that came up in the consultation in West Greenwich, the high-level sentiment, and the number of comments for each. And table 8.78 does the same for East Greenwich. So in making this call in tonight, I asked for an updated version of that table with an extra column added, which explains how those themes have been accounted for in the amended proposals. Because the council's view to my comments on this is that, well, we have listened because we've changed the scheme. Um, that table, updated table, isn't forthcoming. I, I, I haven't seen that in the response to the call in. Um, but I think in truth, it would have been difficult for the council to um, to do that as I'd requested, because I think when you look through the most common themes uh, coming up in those tables, you'll see that um, the majority of the themes that came up in the consultation haven't been addressed through the amendments made to the tweaked option A. Some of them have about exemptions, um, but the vast majority haven't. And, you know, it would have been helpful to see that updated table. We don't have it in front of us. 
Um, but I think it does just demonstrate that in so many different aspects, the themes that came up in the consultation haven't been listened to. So, um, to come on to the questions, just the final thing before I come on to three questions on this issue. Um, the previous government issued new guidance on LTNs in March. That came from the Department for Transport. That guidance says everyone should feel they have been listened to and authorities, local authorities, should seek evidence of strong local understanding and support for proposed changes. Local authorities should not impose schemes in the face of strong local opposition that is clearly representative of the views of the community. So I, one of my questions relates to that guidance. I just want to surface that for the meeting. I think it's certainly clear that um, this decision is not compliant with that new central government guidance issued in March. So th those are sort of my comments on this first bucket of issues about the consultation process. So if I could ask three questions of the cabinet member and of officers on this, if I may, Chair. Um, you would normally address us and we might then ask the questions of the cabinet member, but yes, feel free to serve some at the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll share the questions and then I'll, you, you can use your good offices about whether to ask them. Um, so, uh, a, uh, question A is, do you accept, uh, does, do officers accept that the decision to go ahead with the scheme was predetermined and that there was no level of opposition that would have led to the Council changing its mind? I, th I just think we, we need a, an answer on that from the Council about predetermination. Uh, the second question is, um, if, the, if they were to run the consultation process again, do they accept that a public campaigning leaflet um, would not be something they would repeat? You know, do they accept the, uh, the, the harm that's had on public confidence in the process? And thirdly, um, how has the council um, evidenced that this decision is compliant with that new Department for Transport guidance in March? So that is the kind of first bucket. Um, the next two are quicker, Chair. Um, the second uh, sort of bucket of issues is around the fact that not all options have been consulted on. So uh, in particular, this amended scheme that is being proposed, so option A with tweaks, hasn't been consulted on specifically before this decision is being made. Um, I understand that the Council is effectively proposing to use the experimental traffic order itself as a sort of consultation, kind of the clues in the name, you know, it's, it's experimental and then it's reviewed. Um, so the, the approach is we'll try this and we'll get feedback on it before deciding whether to make it permanent. But I just think before causing this much disruption for such a prolonged period of time during the ETO, and also given how sensitive and controversial the issue has been, it would be far better to consult on that specific proposal now. And I don't think that should, needs to be or should be a lengthy consultation. I think it could be easily done online through commonplace. I think if, if it's consulted on in a neutral way with the precise details of what's being proposed, I don't know what argument the council could have to not, for not doing that. Um, and secondly, as well, option C, which is rejected in the decision paper, which is the version of the proposal where local residents within the scheme area would be able to buy an exemption permit that option has been rejected, um, but hasn't been consulted on either. Now, there's arguments for that. There's also issues with it, which I accept. But again, it hasn't been consulted on. So I think there's a case to consult on both of those options in this limited uh, consultation before the decision goes ahead. So um, uh, the question, I guess, on that is, you know, um, why wouldn't the council, if, if the council thinks it's amended um, the scheme based on the consultation, why wouldn't they want to demonstrate public support for the changes that they are advocating? And then th uh, the third bucket of issues is around impact on boundary areas. So, you know, in my call-in, I've expressed the concern that the impact on uh, Charlton and other areas uh, hasn't been fully taken into account. I'm conscious one of the councillors for Charlton Hornfair Ward is a party to the other call-in, so, you know, I'm not going to speak at length about this at all. Um, but, you know, again, it's an issue of process for me. This, uh, the residents inside the scheme area were written to about this uh, consultation extensively. Uh, but residents in neighbouring areas weren't proactively communicated with as part of the consultation, even though this is going to have a big impact on those boundary areas. 
Um, some residents in other parts of Blackheath didn't receive notice of the consultation, but then they did receive this campaigning leaflet two weeks after it closed, uh, which caused a lot of consternation. Um, and the council's response to my call-in says the fact that so many people from outside of East and West Greenwich sent responses in online kind of shows that I'm not, you know, I've got, I've got nothing to worry about, that it, that it worked. But I think it proves the exact opposite. I think the fact that so many people um, took part in the consultation from Charlton and elsewhere, despite the fact they weren't proactively communicated with in the same way, I think that shows the sheer level of opposition from those neighbouring areas. I think if the council had written proactively to people in places like Eastcombe Avenue, Victoria Way, Marlborough Lane, where there's huge concerns about the impact on additional traffic, um, I think it would have been an even stronger opposition um, to the plans. And um, in, also in its response, the council says, uh, you know, it it's kind of points to the uh, academic studies in what I'm aware is a highly contentious academic sort of debate about whether LTNs actually work. It points to various uh, individual studies that that it says do not significantly increase traffic, uh, that claim that LTNs do not significantly increase traffic uh, and or impacts on border roads. But I think everybody is aware, anyone who lives on Mays Hill knows otherwise, because we've got lived experience of these schemes in, uh, in the borough. Um, and the council um, pointed me to Appendix D of the report in 2022, um, and that report that I've been pointed to has the figures. Mays Hill saw a daily increase of 800 vehicles, 27% increase, and Vanbrugh Hill, a 16% increase. So I'm being pointed to these academic reports, sort of contested uh, reports, claiming that LTNs don't increase traffic elsewhere, but we seem to be relying on those reports, the council seems to be relying on those reports and ignoring the lived experience of people in, uh, in the borough, our residents who have seen that for themselves uh, in Mays Hill previously in that previous example. So, um, questions I wanna ask on this sort of third bucket of issues is um, if the council were to do this again, this consultation again, would they accept that they should also write and proactively communicate to residents in the neighboring area? And then secondly, um, does the council accept that traffic is going to increase in Charlton as a result of this scheme? And if so, how much of an increase in traffic does it consider acceptable? So those are the three big issues. Um, the alternative decision that I'm, I've called for in the call-in for you to consider as a panel is that um, I think it should be referred back to the decision maker with comments um, that given the huge public opposition um, to all the options that's been proposed, the council should go back develop a wider range of options, to try and find an option that does command public support, consult fully uh, on that, both in the affected area and also the uh, neighboring areas in a neutral and unbiased way, and then bring forward a new decision if and only if an option could be found that commands public support. So that's what I kind of put in the call in notice. Um, and the, that in, the, in the kind of interim sort of, you know, if, if that's not accepted, I think a, a, a very reasonable comment to make would be that this specific proposal should be put to a specific consultation, as I mentioned earlier. Um, if the council thinks that it's done a, a, a good job of listening to people and amending the scheme, why not put, to that, put that to the test in a consultation on the specific scheme? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hartley. Do any members of the panel have any questions for Councillor Hartley? Uh, yes, Councillor Greenwell. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hartley, for that presentation. Can I just ask you, going back to um, the uh, consultation process and the way that you say it was not a fair process and some of the questions that were asked were not appropriate and clear, can you sort of remember, do you know any of the questions that were asked at all? 
So I think we've all filled in enough um, local authority and sort of public sector consultations to know the kind of thing that residents have kind of raised about this. And the council's policy is that it wants to re cut um, car use and it will do that through tra um, traffic management schemes. So the consultation was written from that point of view. So the questions were very much geared around the um, benefits of the scheme. They did allow people to, uh, uh, to kind of give negative uh, opinions, as can be seen in the results, but residents have said to me that they didn't feel they had an uh, ability to fully express that opposition. So, for example, there was no question that said, do you think, you know, do you, do you disagree with this whole approach? Um, there were, it was all from a position of um, your, you know, you, you as a resident, your views on different aspects of the scheme that we will be introducing. Um, and you could make negative comments about those different aspects, but it, well, there wasn't an ability to uh, give an uh, uh, opposition to the fundamental nature of what the council was planning to do. Is it all right if I... I don't know whether we're, we're allowed or not, but is it possible for the um, panel to have a look at, because I haven't seen it, one of those magazines, the, the, the leaflet that was dropped through the doors. Is that allowed? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, can I now ask the cabinet member if she would like to respond to any of those points or she would like the officers to respond to any of those points? Okay, sorry, sorry. Right, um, I'm going to give a broad sort of um, overview of some of the um, issues raised by um, Councillor Hartley um, and then um, pass on to the officers to deal with um, the technical aspects. Um, on his first point, which was the um, perception that the consultation was flawed, um, I'd like to say that the, cons the council um, has conducted extensive um, consultations with residents, businesses, and community groups to shape transport proposals in this area. The consultations went beyond um, statutory requirements and influenced the design of the new neighborhood traffic uh, management scheme. The council conducted two non-statutory consultations beyond the legally required um, experimental traffic order. Um, this shows our commitment to involving stakeholders in shaping the design of the scheme. And the Council will continue to follow the process, due process, by conducting consultations and considering feedback. Many responses were received, um, over 8,000, 8, um, and the feedback led to significant amendments to the proposed scheme. The council will continue to engage stakeholders in further consultations because, you know, this, what we had proposed and what we are proposing is a, an experimental traffic order, um, which is what um, uh, 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 Councillor Hartley um, commented on. So that process is an ongoing process. In terms of um, the limited ability of those opposed to the proposal to be able to fully express their views, I would suggest that the Council's policy emphasizes the need for significant shift in travel behavior to achieve our goal of net zero um, carbon emissions by 2030, um, and doing nothing would not achieve this aim. So doing nothing option was actively, um, was never actively proposed. Um, however, the consultation allowed people to tell us um, if they did not think that we should do anything. And the analysis in the decision report clearly identifies some of these views. The recommendation, uh, the recommended option included significant changes based on that feedback. 
And um, I, we, I think we need to note that um, the role of the consultation was never a referendum. Um, the consultation um, was designed to help us understand people's views on design proposals, um, developed both um, following stage one consultation and to inform the decision, a decision on options um, for delivering the council's established objectives for a safer, greener transport network for the local community. The engagement that was undertaken provided important information about the local community's views to consider alongside other factors that were set out in the decision report. We have to consider a wide range of views, Chair, um, and other issues relevant to proposals such as public health and so on. It is for the decision maker to carefully consider and weigh up um, these range of views and other issues in making a decision. Um, on the issue that there was limited geographical scope um, with residents, um, our consultation aimed to engage as many people as possible and was open to all respondents. And all respondents were considered in the decision report. Information about the consultation was delivered to every address in the area, that, the affected area. And um, it received extensive publicity through various media channels. Now, 26% of the respondents were from West Greenwich whilst 21 from East Greenwich area. This clearly shows, as, as uh, Councillor Hartley said, that a significant number of respondents from outside the area um, that was contacted directly did engage in the process. But it's also important to note that we do not accept that uh, the displacement suggestion um, in the reasons um, that will happen. And I think the best uh, test for that, whether there's displacement or not, will be um, when we put in that um, experimental order. And that's when we'll be able to measure. But from our experience, um, in terms of other LTNs, this has been reasonably minimal. And the figures that um, Councillor Hartley quoted about increased was when we had the um, experimental order for just one um, part of this. Um, this was um, in the last administration. And one of the things that was very clear and that came out of that was that if you're going to look at one part, you need to look at the second part. Otherwise, you then get that displacement. And that was the reason we looked at both um, the East Greenwich and the West Greenwich um, concurrently. In terms of the impression that the decision was predetermined, um, I'd like to say that a step change in travel behavior um, is necessary to improve health and to achieve net zero. The options consulted on were designed to help deliver these policy uh, objectives. This was in the uh, manifesto. This was clearly um, council policy um, for years prior to this um, coming through. Um, and the, this um, provided a really strong policy basis. So it was inevitable that, we would, um, that it would be apparent that the council was supportive of this type of measure. However, the consultations were genuine and extensive listening exercises. The decision report clearly documents the full range of views expressed for consideration in the decision. People's responses directly influenced the preferred option, which included significant amendments arising from the consultation feedback. All of this was considered carefully and the decision was certainly not predetermined. In terms of um, the comment on the results that have been obtained um, have not been sufficiently taken into account in coming to the decision. Um, I would say the reasons for the recommendations uh, provided in section seven of the decision report summarizes how the results of the consultation exercises shaped the options and recommendations. 
The results of the consultation exercises were also explored in significant detail in section nine of that decision report, and it formed an important consideration to that decision. In direct response to this feedback, the preferred option recommended in the report contained a number of significant amendments to that report, um, and that was to replace the hard closures with ANPR, to extend the exemptions proposed um, in the consultation um, paper, and um, to include part-time operation of the camera con controlled restrictions um, to weekdays only and peak hours only in that time. These are significant changes to the proposals. They reduce the scheme's benefits and increases the cost and risk to the council, but allow us to deliver a scheme that delivers the council's policy, which have also been consulted on and, were, and are required to be considered in our decision-making process as well, in a way that reflects the uh, feedback that we received. In terms of the um, responses, um, the consultation does meet, um, it does meet and often exceeds all current requirements um, and guidance for engagement in this situation. It was a genuine effort to involve stakeholders and their feedback has significantly influenced how we made the recommendations. The decision report states that all options except for the option to withdraw the proposal would be introduced under an experimental traffic order. Um, statutory consultation occurs during that experimental um, order's operation to allow people to respond based on real world experience rather than um, academic uh, suggestions of displacement, etc. Nevertheless, we've also consulted extensively um, and the consultation to data has directly influenced, as I've said earlier, the preferred option. The significant amendments proposed to the preferred option recommended came directly from this feedback. And respondents provided us with significant insight on these options ahead of undertaking statutory consultation as part of an experimental traffic order. So the preferred option would be consulted upon in line with and often beyond any statutory requirements and guidance. So this scheme is from some chair part of our transport strategy, which sets out to reduce traffic and its impacts. There's a growing evidence base suggesting that schemes of this type have not increased um, traffic or impacts on border roads. This includes uh, significant academic um, literature, which my colleague was kind of poo-pooing here. Um, but even with that in mind, by having the experimental traffic order, we will be in a better position to be able to measure that displacement, if there is any, and take any sort of action to, to, to deal with it. The very nature of an experimental order is, um, it is what it says on the tin. Um, traffic will be monitored um, before and after the implementation. The recommended option will uh, progress under an experimental traffic order so that the measures will closely be monitored and flexibly, fle flexibility uh, for, for further changes, if needs be, will um, be uh, put into that. Uh, my colleague says there's no details um, of plans to monitor the impact on air pollution um, before and under and after. Well, the decision report sets out clear proposals for monitoring and, and that includes um, air quality. We propose to commission a comprehensive package of uh, monitoring and evaluation. The precise details of the package depend on finalizing agreements with a provider, and that obviously depends on what um, 
transpires after today. And um, that will cover necessary time periods to establish a baseline, to cover the settling um, in period of the decision um, after opening, and assess the impacts of the trial once people begin to understand those impacts. It will also cover the following um, scope. It will cover traffic data, air quality, queue lengths, and bus journey times. In order to support full discussion of this um, decision, um, I would like to request um, that um, he says further data my colleague asked for. Well, we've given what we could, um, but we have to also be mindful that um, there, there was some information that was not, and I think you've been, that's been covered with you um, in terms of GDPR, etc. cetera. Um, I'll pass on to my colleagues, um, my, the officers, uh, if there's any additional um, bits that they want to add, and then I'll um, take questions. Um, I don't have anything else to add unless there's any gaps in the responses, but I've followed the calling requests and I think they'd all be met and answered. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I've got a question. I think you made reference to the, uh, the uh, transport strategy that we consulted with or we sent um, correspondence out to 9,200 of which 8,000 responded. Um, the population of the borough is, as you know, 289,000 uh, residents. What I want to know, in your opinion or um, from officers' experience, is this, norm that's around about 3%, so is this normally the, the, the um, uh, amount of residents we do a um, amount of response for a borough-wide uh, consultation? And bearing in mind for this specific area, were we able to drill down in the uh, transport strategy, because it links, were we able to drill down into the responses on the transport strategy for this specific area? How many residents were represented in the transport strategy that responded? I don't know if that information is available. Um, from memory, we had more responses for this consultation than we did for all of the responses for the transport strategy. Um, oh, apologies. Um, yeah, obviously, we specifically targeted with letter drops in a particular area. We didn't do that with the transport strategy. We did have workshops. We had uh, literature in libraries. We, you know, we also tried to do this, but typically we would see more responses from an area-based consultation as opposed to general uh, you know, council-wide, borough-wide consultation for a particular strategy or policy. What I wanted to know if that percentage of response is general, um, is it representative of, of normal consultation? I just want to um, hear your reply to, because I think Councillor Hartley may, raised a, a point, a va very valid point in terms of the consultation process, but also the, uh, the leaflet that was dropped. And I just want to hear from you in terms of the responses is that normal for the council on this type of consultation? I would say we received a higher response rate than we ever usually do on a typical scheme. Councillor Greenwell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this uh, Councillor Lacau. Um, Councillor Hartley um, talked about the opposition to the West Greenwich and East Greenwich um, to the consultations that you held. And I, I can't remember whether you touched on this or not, but he referred to with the, the different options for ABC, 68%, 69, 70 in West Greenwich, and in East Greenwich, 79, 77, 73. What normally would you take? I mean, that's sort of like three quarters of the responses. Uh, negative, what normally would you take as a sort of bench figure if you are looking at opposition to some, you know, to, to anything? And, and when would you say, okay, 
that's not viable. Residents do not want that. I think you have to put this in context of um, in one of the areas, 20 something, 20, 26 people uh, percent responded from the area um, and of the respondents, that's what you got. But let's just also be um, um, straight with this. We have a responsibility as um, councillors for um, a broader set of issues, and that's what I said earlier. Um, for example, we cannot um, go, uh, do away with uh, considerations for the public health considerations um, of uh, p uh, residents in the borough. Um, and for me, I kind of liken it with sometimes when you're making some of these uh, changes, it's, you know, and I can put up my hands, I'm, 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 I'm one of those. But there was once a time when um, people who smoked said, you know, it was in, fringing on our rights. And I, I'm saying this as a smoker, please, um, to, to, to stop me smoking in public. Um, but I know that clearly that it's, it's, it is impacting on, 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 on other people's health. What we have is we are having to balance, um, when we make decisions, a whole raft of things. And as I said, this isn't, wasn't a referendum. What we were trying to consult on is how to get the best possible options that would um, be able to help calm traffic. Um, one of the biggest things that people talked about in the, if you looked at the um, stats, was the perception of safety. Um, and if you've got fast moving traffic, then you know, you'd know you be expecting that um, we would take that into consideration. So there were very many aspects and there were sort of um, granular things to just say um, one, uh, each comment did not just say, we don't want this. They had lots of other aspects, it was broken down. And that's why we broke it down in the way we did. Um, but as I say, I had to make a decision against um, a raft of decisions. Thank you. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about consultation after an experimental traffic order comes into place. So obviously in the report it talks about the experimental traffic order can last for 18 months. Consultation tends to be at the first six months of that. Can you talk to me a little bit about if the decision goes ahead and the traffic order is implemented, what the consultation will look like during that six months and what level of um, dissent would, would you th then look at making a what level of dissent to that would um, affect your decision whether or not to make the order permanent? Thank you. So, um, first and foremost, we don't typically have a framework for determining, as Councillor Carroll eloquently put, there's that balance that needs to be made. So it's never definitive to have a framework of decision-making in terms of responses, and I'm not aware of any other council that has that in place for any scheme or transport scheme especially. So if the decision was to be taken forward, the experimental traffic order lasts for 18 months. The first six months of that is the experimental period where we receive um, and we would have a platform in place similar to what we used or the same as what we used in the previous round of engagement to receive those responses on how the scheme is working. In my mind, the way it would work is we need to allow for a bedding in period of, you know, from previous experience, around 12 weeks. Um, and we would look to plan to do further engagement with residents during that period to get um, you know, on the ground feedback. And we'll also have a monitoring strategy in place to monitor all of the traffic air quality, queue lengths, et cetera, um, whilst the scheme is in operation. Um, if we were to make a change at any point, we would say in the first three months we would be aware of what they, those would be. Once a change is made, it would then actually restart the consultation clock again. 
So if we made any amendments during that first six months, even if it was the last day of the six month period, that would then extend the consultation period for another six months, which would bring us up to uh, the 12 month mark where a decision would need to be made. Um, I don't know what I've missed there. That's where it will look like in reality. Um, yeah. But I think it's important to note that um, it cannot just keep getting extended and extended. It has to be wound up within 18 months, one way or another. And in terms of that consultation, what are your proposals? It, so if we're looking at the consultation that happened before, are you looking at letter drops? Would it stay in that immediate area? Are you going to go as far as Charlton? Have you thought about what that consultation process would look like for that six months? Well, um, I will I'll, I'll say that, of course, um, going into it, because we would be able to um, have a sense of what is, it, it feels like, in that bedding in period, then we would be extending it um, in that uh, period to the uh, um, surrounding areas to see, um, to get some feel about what, because what that impact is, if there is any. Um, and one of the things I would be looking to, to see is if there is an impact, what um, additional decisions could we make to, 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 to um, minimize that impact? if that's the case. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hartley also brought up the draft government guidance. Now, I appreciate that it's draft guidance. We don't know if it's going to be final guidance, but I did note that in your response, neither of you mentioned that guidance, and I wondered if you wanted to make any comment um, on that. Um, I mean, to be honest, it's been really difficult pan London to get any advice on this matter and um, I know that LOTAG, um, a London body that we use as transport um, people, um, actually referred to get some legal advice to this and unfortunately you know it is still effectively draft guidance um, and we have in you know we've done two non-statutory consultations we are now moving into the statutory consultation phase of this process um, and at the moment, what we are governed by is the Road Traffic Regulation Act. Um, that's the only real legislation that we have to work to. So, of course, we consider it. Um, but up to this point, we've not really had any real firm further guidance on how or when we would need to implement that. Um, and I think we know we're still in that, in that phase where we're still giving people the opportunity to feedback during the, the, the upcoming uh, consultation it was decided so it's been really difficult to 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 try and digest that um, and it's gone very quiet if i'm honest um sorry the final question for me on this is what would you consider success to be for the experimental traffic order what what would be the measures you would you would take to say this is working well well i would start by saying um increased safety sense of safety um, better air quality and um, residents feeling that um, it's, 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 it's enhanced their ability to move about um, and, and also for active travel and safety. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the panel? No. Um, we normally wouldn't go, sorry, just one second.
Sorry about that. Um, a final question from me. Um, is there anything you want to say in relation to the leaflet that Councillor Hartley provided to the panel? Um, yeah, thank you. That leaflet was as a result of a leaflet that had gone out um, bef uh, to, to residents before, and it was giving information that was not correct. And so the leaflet was designed to correct that. And, you know, that's why I think it was called um, by Comza uh, myth busting. Um, but it was as a direct result of a leaflet that had gone prior to that. And yes, and um, encourage people to respond. So it was as a, it was purely um, a response to something that had gone out to all residents. Sorry, can I just ask what was the previous leaflet about that was the, the wrong leaflet? that were given the wrong information. Councillor Greenwell, I didn't um, set out that. I did not um, publish that leaflet. It was published and residents sent it to us to say, look at what's coming through our letterboxes. And this is the information some people are putting out who I can't even remember who it was. And so what we were doing was to respond directly to give the right, um, the correct information. So it was by another party elsewhere. Thank you. Councillor Hartley, we wouldn't normally go back to you, but have you got a further point you wanted to make? Yeah, fair enough, Chair. I mean, in every call-in I've done, there's been an opportunity for the call-in signatories to ask questions, and there's been a bit of back and forth. But, I mean, you've raised some of the questions that I asked, but there's just a couple that haven't been addressed, if, if that's okay. I mean, really, the, the main... There's, there's two ones just... I know there's a lot of people who want to speak. There's two big things. That gov government guidance, draft guidance in March, I just want to quote from it again. Local authorities should not impose schemes in the face of strong local opposition that is clearly representative of the views of the community. I appreciate its draft, but are, is the council really saying that, that it's going to ignore the spirit of that draft dr Department of Transport guidance? Does anybody really think that any government, and the new government is going to come in and say, local authorities should impose schemes in the face of strong local opposition, because that's exactly what's happening here. I think it's, it's kind of willfully ignoring that guidance in a, in a way that I don't think is justifiable. The question that I, I hasn't been addressed uh, by the cabinet member or officers is about the amended option A. Why wouldn't they put that to consultation? I wondered if you might allow that to be asked, um, as that's the kind of main thrust of what I would want them to, to do. Thank you. Would you like to address those points? Okay. Um, number one, if the, the decision was made before the guidance was published, I'm sure. Um, but notwithstanding that, it was a draft guidance at the time. Um, but in terms of um, putting the options um, back for consultation, I do believe that what we're saying is by having an experimental traffic order, we are consulting on those very uh, amendments that we've um, introduced. Um, we believe that the, that is correct and the decision was published on the 29th of February and the guidance was published in March. And here we are in July with Purda periods having given ample time to reflect on government guidance that's been around now for months. And I just find it, I, I don't know why we're still here. Local authorities should not impose schemes in the face of strong local opposition. That's exactly what we've got here. And, and that's a political choice, but it, it, it appears that's the choice that's been made. But sophistry over dates, you know, this guidance has been around for a long time. It's the 31st of July uh, on the day that we're discussing it. Thank you. There was a second part of your question addressed there. I think, I think the answer was no. <laughs> that the council doesn't want to consult and considers the experimental... It was not the answer. Um, please don't put words in my mouth. What I said was the experimental traffic order that would be put in place would consult on, with the whole package, including those changes. Thank you, Councillor O'Carroll. That's clear. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Hartley. If I can ask the signatories to the second call-in to now come to the table. Good evening. <laughs> um, I'm not sure which order you want to go in, so I will just hand you the floor. If you don't make a decision, I will. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. Um, I am Councillor uh, Maisie richards Cottell, and I represent East Greenwich Ward, which is partly covered by this scheme. I've been a councillor since May 2022, and I also personally live on one of the boundary roads of the scheme. I've lived in this area a long time, and I'm overall very supportive of initiatives to reduce traffic in East Greenwich, an area which does genuinely have a lot of problems with traffic. I'm also mindful that I represent a range of residents and their views, we felt it was important to call in this decision to give greater scrutiny, but also seek amendments if a trial is going ahead. This, the call-in asks that if the scheme is implemented, that certain amendments are made, and I will be speaking to some of them and then hand over to my co-councillors. We welcome that Amendment 1 and 3 for the hard closures on Park Vista and Gloucester Circus to remain in place have been accepted in the response report, which is paragraph 5.46 and 5.53 respectively. Both hard closures were installed over the last decade, were campaigned for by residents, and both have been very successful at increasing pedestrian safety and calming traffic in their areas. It is the right decision that these hard closures remain in place. Likewise, we welcome the amendment four in our call-in for Cade Road to remain open and retain the current double yellow line parking restrictions has been accepted in the response report, paragraph 5.55. The current arrangement of Cade Road being a two-way road is sensible and it is good that the status quo will remain. Regarding Mays Hill, Amendment 6 on our call-in related to the positioning of the timed camera controlled closure on Mays Hill, the report with paragraph 5.56 suggests it will now be near the junction of Tom Smith Close. I think this location seems to be a sensible compromise between residents who want access and residents, um, particularly some of those who I represent, near the Trafalgar Road end, um, who have had really unacceptable standstill traffic outside their houses for years, and this scheme is trying to address. I hope the effect of this positioning is monitored during any trial. With Maidenstone Hill and Winforton Street, Amendment 5 in our call-in has been addressed in the addendum. It stated that Maidenstone Hill and Winforton Street are not suitable for cut-through traffic and should have the hard closures as in the original consultation. The addendum gives reasons for this amendment not being supported, that feedback from emergency services and the council's waste services strongly support the replacement of hard closures with ANP cameras wherever possible. I have several comments to make about this. The eastern end of Maidenstone Hill is very narrow it is obvious to anyone who has seen the road that it is not suitable at all for two-way traffic. Cars and vans are having to mount the pavements to drive down it. The bollards that have been installed on the pavements by this council are testament to the unsuitability of this road to cut through traffic and the danger it is causing to all road users. The pavements are also very narrow, meaning wheelchairs and pushchairs are having to use the road too. Having a timed ANP car... PR camera doesn't solve the issue of the suitability of this road to two-way traffic outside the timed hours. There is a difference between roads which have high volumes of traffic, which the scheme is trying to reduce, 
and roads which are unsuitable for two-way traffic at all. Residents in these roads feel there is a disconnect between what was consulted on and what has been proposed. The stage two consultation proposed hard closures for Maidenstone Hill and Winforton Street, and residents responded to the consultation based on that option and mostly supported option A. Had they been given the option of a timed camera-controlled closure under option A, they may well have supported option C, which proposed a no-entry sign at the junction with Point Hill instead. In relation to council waste services accessing Maidenstone Hill, the current services lorries cannot access Maidenstone Hill from Point Hill currently because the road is too narrow. Instead, they drive in from the western end and residents who live at the eastern end move their bins down the road to be picked up. So although I appreciate the reason in the response report about waste services access being applied broadly, it doesn't apply in the case of Maidenstone Hill as the waste services already cannot access Maidenstone Hill from Point Hill. If a hard closure is not suitable from an emergency services point of view, I would ask the cabinet member if she would consider installing a gate. There are many examples of gates being used on roads in the borough. Oh, I'm sorry. Both Winforton Street and Maidenstone Hill are often used as cut-throughs from the A2, and a further complication with these roads will be when the TfL implement a new pedestrian crossing scheme for Blackheath Hill and its impact on diverting traffic through these streets. Could the cabinet member comment further on this? I would also like to comment on the timings of the scheme, which relates to several of the amendments we have put forward. The original consultation was for a 24-7 scheme and has now been moved to weekday peak time only. I understand why this has been done in light of the consultation responses. A potential disadvantage of a timed scheme is that it will cause traffic queues where drivers are waiting for the camera enforcement to be lifted, like what we used to see when Greenwich Park had a road. Drivers would queue, waiting for the time, and then drive through. I would like the cabinet member to outline what she proposes to do if we see similar queues in any trial, and how the monitoring during any trial will be used to inform any changes to either the times of when the scheme is operating or the positions of the cameras. Uh, as some final thoughts, I personally believe the trial should go ahead with the amendments we proposed and consultation to continue during the trial. Only by doing the trial will we see the effect of the scheme, then informed decisions about any changes can be made. The scheme is also in line with the Council's transport strategy, our Greenwich plan and carbon neutral plan. To look at the bigger picture, sat-navs and route-finding apps are changing drivers' behaviour, sending traffic down roads that are completely unsuitable for high levels of traffic, the effects of which we are seeing in East Greenwich. Councils are looking for ways to counterbalance the technological advance but still, but still protect neighbourhoods and people's health. We are also going to see a big population increase over the peninsula over the next decade, with over 17,000 new homes being built. This will increase the amount of people and vehicles coming into and through the area. Likewise, we also have the Silvertown Tunnel opening next year and the effect of that on our local road system. I have spoken to many residents throughout this consultation process and the majority have engaged in a very constructive way. Some of the consultation events were not perhaps the most suitable format, but I will say that every consultation event was better than the one before. They improved a lot and I went to all of them. As a ward councillor, this has been a challenging process, and this scheme has taken a lot of time and energy. And I would also like to thank officers, uh, Councillor Cow and fellow councillors, for trying to find a way through while representing all residents. Could I ask the member to uh, respond to my comments about the, the timings and the comments I also made about Maiden Stone Hill and Winforton Street? I'll now pass over to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to say I'm here today speaking as a local councillor representing residents of Blackheath Westcombe, uh, raising the issues residents have wave, raised with me and my colleagues. I just wanted to make it clear in these proceedings I am not attending today in my capacity as Chief, Deputy Chief Whip of the Labour Party. Thank you. I would like to raise the issue around communication and understanding of the scheme. I have received many emails from residents unaware of the scheme or with a misunderstanding of what was being proposed. I've had feedback from estates, local estates and local businesses who are also unaware of the scheme. And is, is there any way that this issue can be addressed? Because I really do think it's an important one. Residents also found the whole consulta consultation very confusing. The maps were unclear and many felt they could not effectively feed back their concerns with left some feeling ignored. 
Others were unclear as to what was being proposed. Many didn't understand that this was a trial period, an experimental traffic order. The specific concerns that the residents have asked us to raise were that Langton Way was an unadopted road the council has no jurisdiction over, was being included in part of the scheme. We were keen to seek reassurances from residents that the Langton Way was no part of this scheme. Residents were also unclear from the maps and consultation as, if, as to if there could be unintended consequences of pushing traffic down Langton Way. In regards to Mays Hill, residents had been keen to advise that this would be best to move the Mays Hill modular filter from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. The report states that the Mays Hill time camera is to be moved towards the bottom of the hill near the junction of Thomas Smith Close. This is greatly appreciated and I believe we have some residents from Mays Hill here speaking tonight. Officers have clarified that a small section of Langton Way is an adopted highway. This is the section of the road with no houses that runs parallel to the flyover leading to Old Dover Road. Officers have confirmed that the unadopted road will not be part of the council scheme. It is only the section with no housing that will have a camera, no hard closure, at the junction entering Old Dover Road. So the questions I have are, can we provide reassurances to residents living on the unadopted section of Langton Way that traffic will not dive, divert through their, 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 their tiny road and also the other roads in the area that don't come under the scheme? Can they explain what their modelling shows, i.e. which direction traffic will flow when the cameras are in operation? And what recourse is there to residents if there is an unintended consequence of pushing traffic down the unadapted section of Langton, Langton Way and the, and the other surrounding roads. Also, Chair, I've was been asked just to raise a quick point, if I may, from the residents of Gloucester Circus, which wasn't in my original uh, calling, but if it's just a very short one. Um, but if officers can't answer, then I can send them the email that I received from residents and they can answer directly. But I would just, just say, so I've, I've been asked by the residents of Gloucester Circus to raise the issues around the removal of bollards. I'm unclear with the area myself, but I do have the photos. I'm not sure if you're still going to remove or leave in situ. Could you explain on this if there is an option to keep, keep them? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Salden. Thank you, Chair. I'm Councillor Lakshan Seldin. I am the Ward Councillor for Charlton Horn Fair, and I also have lived there for 27 years. Um, going last, I'll try and be brief and not cover any points that have already been raised by my colleagues, uh, either currently or previously uh, to the panel. I recognise, as most of us do, that we actually face a triple threat of a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, and a public health crisis. And these are no small things. And these are things that we need to do something about. We can't leave these decisions. And unfortunately, we need to recognize that traffic coming into the borough from outside of the borough is a large contributor to these issues and how they affect our residents, both in this generation and in future generations to come. However, the imperative to do something cannot be at the expense of other residents. And I speak in particular in relation to my concerns and the concerns raised by residents in the Charlton Hornfair area, but not just our area, but in other surrounding wards as well. Therefore, I was very pleased that these concerns were addressed by officers uh, so comprehensively in section 5.42 of their reply report. Uh, covering the scope for traffic collection data, air quality data collection, uh, queue lengths, bus journey times, and uh, pedestrian and cycle counts. I think these are very favorable and they address a lot of the concern that have been raised by myself and residents. Uh, I'd also like to point out we have a number of far smaller but similar designed uh, low traffic neighborhoods operating on timed periods in the form of school streets within our area and I recognize from my experience as a councillor that whilst there was initial opposition, uh, once that has settled in and they're bedded in, they are now perceived as very positively 
and where there has been an issue where they haven't been in an operation for a period of time, residents have been in touch with me to say, when can we have these back? So I think we need to balance those things. Uh, a lot of the concerns that have been raised to me, and indeed my own concerns, have been highly subjective. Uh, I worry about traffic displacement because it seems pretty obvious to me that if you close some roads, that's got to go somewhere else. Therefore, I welcome the trial and the approach taken with the experimental order because I think this will give us the hard data that will allow us to evaluate whether these things work. I recognize the information that officers have provided in section 5.37 with the ac various academic studies, but you know, nothing really beats the hard data that we can actually gather locally that will be specific to the particular scheme. So having said all of that, one of my concerns is, as we record this data, what is going to provide the trigger point for subsequent changes to that, and how quickly can we see these coming in, and recognizing that there will be periods of unsettlement around the introduction of schemes. There will be a, potentially, if you read the reports, a short-term temporary increase in traffic around some boundary raids. Where are officers perceiving these trigger points for making changes to the scheme? And uh, those conclude my remarks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do any of the panel members have questions for the councillors who raised the call in? Or should we move to the cabinet member? No? Um, Um, Councillor Lacau, would you like to address any of those points, please? Thank you, Chair. As quite a lot of this has been addressed in the um, report, I'm going to pass some of the issues that were raised um, to the officers because a lot of them are, uh, would cover some of the technical points, and I will certainly make my um, evaluation after all of this is balanced out. Thank you. Um, so on to Councillor Richard Cottle in terms of Maiden and Stonehill, I think that was the only main point raised and Winforton Street, is that correct? Were that two, two main points, two main roads. Um, obviously there, you know, there were gonna be some elements of moving to a, a part-time operation that, that, was, that was then gonna, um, the reaction of that was that there'd be a loss of full-time closure for, for people and obviously replacing that with a hard closure um, is an option that at the moment we would rather not consider because we would want to keep all of the roads with those NPR closures in uh, holistically right throughout the scheme um, and, and monitor how that is working during that time. Because obviously, we, uh, you know, we would see most of the, the poor behavior and traffic use in that road during the peak times anyway. So, you know, it's something that we would continue to monitor and Going back to Councillor Saudin's point, flipping over onto to his points that he read, what will be the trigger points from experience of the last scheme and, and other schemes, whether it, you know, a parking scheme or a road safety scheme to deliver, it'd be very evident quite early on when we'll need to intervene. And we'll obviously work with all of the ward councillors as well um, to, to get that feedback from you there. So I think, you know, particularly uh, on Maidenstone Hill and, and Winforton, we leave it as it is. Um, please, please don't interrupt. Yeah. You'll have your chance to speak later if you've registered to speak. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we can't shy away from the fact there will be closures in that road, albeit they will be part-time, peak only. And so, yeah, okay. Well. Again, please, please don't interrupt. Thank you. Um, yeah, I keep losing my train of thought. We will have closures in place, albeit they won't be full time, and we will monitor them. That is, uh, and we will liaise with councillors in terms of the feedback we receive from from those areas. Councillor Williams, uh, just a question on this specific point. Um, so, in the addendum, it did state that um, the feedback from the emergency services and the waste team were taken into account. Just listening to what uh, uh, the ward count, the councillors who called it in has said, um, can you reassure us or can you give us some, uh, your uh, feedback, were there residents in favour of uh, keeping it as well or did you just base your revised um, consideration on the emergency service and the waste team? Yeah, we didn't wait 
uh, the decision in terms of particular roads in favour of particular closures? So that's what you're asking. So we did a blanket AMPR across to, to cover that. Do you want me to continue with some of the other points are raised? Is that, is that best way to uh, do it? Yes, yeah. that's a great okay. idea. Thank you. Um, so moving on to Councillor Fletcher, in terms of Langton Way, we apologise. I think we mentioned in the report as well that there were some um, illustrative errors in there, um, particularly around the operation of the one way which goes around the, the church um, uh, that comes onto St. John's Park. So there, there will be no major changes to that road, albeit there, there is a closure point at the junction of St. Uh, John's Park and Old Dover Road. Um, so again, we will monitor that. I think what made it difficult was that we were colour coding a road that wasn't public highway on the map that then really drew attention to that. Um, so that, that did cause some confusion, but again, it's something that we'll monitor. And um, again, part-time closures, most of the traffic that we'll see will be in that peak time. We don't anticipate that there'll be any increase um, in terms of traffic movements on that road. Um, in, in regards to what you mentioned about communication, um, I think you know we, it has really been demonstrated that we did reach a lot of people. We did get a, a real high level of responses. But if there are particular businesses or, or from your experience as a ward councillor or any other areas or um, bits that were missed in terms of gaps, then again, we can work with you during that consultation phase um, to try and eke out more feedback from them on that. Um, I did touch on the point, Councillor Saud, in, in regard to the Cholton, in particular the Cholton impact. Um, like I said, I think it will be really evident and really clear where there are concerns, um, and we'll be working with you on those in terms of, you know, we had a recent controlled parking zone that, that we introduced, and when you get that collective feedback from people, we will work with you to be that in most cases that voice and, and, and then decide whether to go out and speak to more residents about particular issues. Um, so, you know, for me, it's from experience, we will respond when we know we'll respond, but we have to take into consideration that these schemes do take time to bed in. Um, we aren't, drivers, you know, tend to be re less reactive. They use mapping. It will take time for that scheme to bed in to Google and Apple and for the algorithms to familiarise themselves with that. So we will need to consider that um, before, we, for, before we take action. Um, I think that was all the points. Thank you. Um, could you also address, I think Councillor Richards Cattell yeah. mentioned p the potential for, with the timings, like uh, traffic queuing up, waiting for the, the clock to turn. And uh, have you considered that, and what are you going to do to address that? To be honest, we're measuring queue lengths as part of that to, to, to try and get away from that. Ultimately, um, the way around that is to extend or decrease times, but you still, you still may get that effect. Um, <coughs> we don't have a mitigation plan for queuing traffic onto particular roads. Would you like a drink? Um, and to be honest, in, in the last scheme, um, we did have a time closure on Hyde Vale, um, and we didn't particularly see any major queuing traffic waiting to enter or exit that road. But again, we have the queue length monitoring in place for that. Can everyone hear me okay, if I'm able to address the chair? So we chose these time periods, 7 to 10 a.m., then 3 to 7. It's based on the ATC data itself. Now, those time periods shows that there's a massive increase of traffic flowing within that area. After around the 10 o'clock period, it drops off dramatically. So based on this and our findings, we're hoping, hopefully addressing your, your question there, that we're not looking to see or not anticipating any queue lengths within, that, within those areas. However, we are taking those measures in trying to met, uh, survey those areas in the queue lengths to ensure that doesn't happen. If it does, we'll have to review the timing or make some changes where needed. Councillor Greenwell. 
Um, thank you, Chair. I don't, well, I don't think I should have registered this, but I live in a pri um, an unadopted road, so I do understand the, the difficulties. Uh, and going back to what Councillor Fletcher said, you know, um, if you are sort of, are you convinced that the unadopted part of Langton Road is, it will be okay? And also, I know it's not directly connected to this, but are there any other unadopted areas within the zone that you're dealing with, uh, that you know of? Uh, well, you're just saying it's difficult to know whether they're unadopted. You have to look closely at the maps. I just wondered if there were any other unadopted areas. No, we aren't aware. In it. No, every road um, that we're implementing measures on is a public highway. Um, and I think the issue is in terms of the impact that it will cause on that particular road. So, because it will impact, won't we? You know, I know that because there are no restrictions on private on unadopted roads. Yeah, you that yes. So, can will you sort of monitor that carefully? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fletcher, was there something else you wanted to raise? Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not. Uh, question specific it was just that if possible would it be uh, could could someone from the highways department visit all the local businesses in Blackheath Westcombe uh, just to discuss the proposals and will all the residents get a letter uh, saying when the scheme will start how it operates where they enter where they exit and then hopefully that would uh, we might be able to pick up on the residents that are unaware of the scheme Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. It would be good to know um, if the experimental track order goes ahead, what communications you're going to have with the residents to explain exactly what's going to happen. <coughs> Sorry, Chair. <coughs> um, I think um, I'm affected by my colleague, uh, um, fellow councillor. Um, of course, we are hoping to... Um, send letters out we've already um and i don't want to pre preempt what decisions come from today but if the experimental order goes through then one of the things would be that we are also working with the business team to um ensure that we are contacting all the businesses as well um and it, i've said in my view that we will be looking at a more sort of extended um, consultation around the surrounding areas um, to address some of the issues that were raised here. Thank you very much. Um, we have no further questions on this part of the call-in. Thank you. Um, we're now going to hear from some other ward councillors who would like to speak. Um, so I think we've got Christine, St. Matthew, Daniels. Oh, we're going to take a very brief comfort break and then we'll move on to councillors and the members of the public. Uh, we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I have been made aware that there is one councillor, Councillor David Gardner, who wants to speak and then we will move straight on to the members of the public. I have a list of those who've registered. I will say your name. Please raise your hand and we will get a microphone to you. Um, please, can I ask that you limit yourself, to, we'll be capping you at two minutes. Please don't raise points that have already been raised, and please only raise matters that are relevant to the call-in. Um, can I also emphasise that speakers should be addressing the subcommittee, not the cabinet member, when making their points. Um, Councillor David Gardner.
70% in London, 85% in the five schemes in Lambeth. Um, and crime is also down, particularly in the walls of Boris, who had these schemes the longest. Above that, uh, Chair, uh, the schemes have led to a huge increase in cycling, 70% within the five schemes in, in, in Lambeth, which is 25% of the borough, and a large increase uh, in walking. I can give more stats on that. Chair, in terms of the bits in my ward, um, I would agree with Councillor Salvin that we do need, and I'm very pleased with that, I want to in the ward, that we do need to have um, county, particularly at the uh, bio-restrictors in the two other North South Roads, in Charlton Church Lane and Victoria Way, which could track displaced traffic on North South routes. Um, and I think that does need to be uh, monitored Thank you. Um, firstly, I'm going to turn to members of the public who are speaking in favour of the implementation, and then I will go to members of the public who are speaking against. The first person on my list is George Edgar. Thank you very much for the opportunity to say that one. Thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to express support for the Council's aim to to make our streets safer and reduce reliance Thank you, Mr. Edgar. Henry Tribe, please. Thank you. 
extends to evidence the dangerous and illegal driving on these roads and on the narrow pavements. This unsuitability will not be addressed by the council's call in response. Mainstone Hill is, de is also a designated play street. Uh, we are asking for permanent closures of this and the Porter Street, which will e uh, extend protection to residents, including children, who use the street for play and accessible schools and local parks. There is no reason why this type of restrictions on similar roads, for example on Circus Street, could not be applied here. The council say that they want to blanket a APR policy, but they are making certain exemptions for that, and we would argue that we should be one of those as well. It's either blanket a APR or it's not, we would say. So, conclusion, we support the measures to reduce traffic and increase safety for residents, but urge the council to go even further, as they have a mandate to do, and allow more roads to enjoy the benefits of uh, well-being and traffic Thank you, Mr. Tribe. Penelope Tolson, please. Thank you, Ms. Tolson. The Thank you. <laughs> Crystal Downey, please. Crystal Downey? No? Um, Michael Armand. Thank you. Um, Michael Armand, I live on Crooms Hill. On, cons on consultation and is that better? On consultation and um, traffic displacement. The impact of I think it's important to remember that this decision is to introduce um, an traffic management and not a permanent scheme. Uh, on a trial basis, only as necessary 
a trial basis as a necessary part of the consultation process. The impact of the decision on traffic levels on boundary roads can only be considered in theory until a trial scheme has been Given that the air quality monitoring is ready. Yes, sorry, okay. <laughs> sorry, given that air quality monitoring stations are already in place, it shouldn't be too complicated to set these with temporary additional stations and traffic counters to get the evidence that's needed on the trial. Remember that restrictions on through traffic by traffic management schemes do not generate additional journeys, as vehicles will already have travelled on boundary roads to arrive at the scheme area perimeter. In my opinion, a more likely outcome is journey evaporation, where drivers, frustrated by not being able to cut through residential streets, make decisions about their travel options that remove their journeys and pollution caused by it from the Greenwich Trunk Road System and TMS Boundary Roads altogether. Consultation during and after the trial scheme has been implemented will be far more meaningful than consultation proposals, as the impact of the scheme inside and outside the control zones can be assessed on the basis of fact rather than speculation. Thank you. Thank you. Ivan Cornell, please. Sorry, hello. Uh, Ms. Bower declared a climate emergency in 2019 and has set a target to reach net zero by 2030. We are now nearly halfway through that this period, yet so far there's been little progress in achieving many of the proposals listed in the various policy documents produced by the Council, such as previously mentioned, the 45% reduction in car use as set out in the carbon neutral plan. Sorry. And from the latest uh, local improvement plan, specifically delivering a program of modal filters of which this scheme under consideration is but a small part. Addressing the climate emergency does mean there are hard decisions to be made that will affect issues such as people's over-reliance on cars for local journeys, but there's no other way of achieving this necessary goal for the sake of the planet and all our futures. As individuals, we can only do so much, and we look to our local council and our elected representatives to act in accordance with a framework that they themselves have established. For that reason, even if the committee members here feel that the current proposed scheme is flawed, it is imperative that we act as soon as possible, and so I ask that they do not refer this decision and allow what, at the end of the day, is only a trial to proceed to the next stage. Thank you. Thank you. Colin Humphreys, please. Colin, are you here? Thank you. This is unorthodox. We'll try. Um, can you hear me? My name is Colin Humphreys. I live on Mays Hill, and I am a member of the Mays Hill Action Group. Over the past 12 years, traffic on our residential roads has increased by 70% due to sat-navs turning our streets into motorways. 29,000 people are killed or seriously injured in traffic accidents, and 31,000 deaths are attributed to obesity each year in the UK. 4,000 people are killed by air pollution in London alone each year. Having said all of that, I'm not here for any of those people. I am here for my two-year-old son and my two-week-old daughter. Road traffic accidents are the leading cause of death among children and young people. Of the last five times I have cycled on Mays Hill with my son on the bike, I have been dangerously close past three of those times. I want to be able to take my son to football without putting his life in danger. I am here to try to save my children's lives by reducing traffic on our residential roads. The Mays Hill residents conducted a survey related to the placement of our AMPR gate in the proposed traffic reduction scheme, and the survey received a unanimous response asking for the gate to be placed at the north end of the road. I want to say a huge thank you to our democratically elected councillors and the officers for proposing the scheme, listening to residents' feedback, and for suggesting this change at the call-in. We support the introduction of the traffic reduction scheme, and we support the call-in changes regarding Mays Hill. The journey to helping people make better journeys 
is difficult, and we need to stand together against the extreme right wing who would rather our children died and our planet burned than they had a five minute longer drive to the shops. I stand together with all the people here today who want to reduce our dependency on cars to create a brighter, healthier future for Greenwich. Thank you, Mr. Humphreys. Do we have Hayley Jeffrey? Hayley Jeffrey? Hayley Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you, councillors, for this opportunity to address you tonight on the important matter for residents of Maidenstone Hill and Winfalton Street. The report suggests AMPR for roads within the scheme, including Maidenstone and Winfalton, and quotes the preference of the emergency services and refuse services for this option. This is not what residents want on these two streets. An important point about timed AMPR which was rejected by the council in one of the many consultations because timed AMPR gives a false sense of security for children as they are unaware when the cameras are on and when they are off. Who does this option benefit? My alternative suggestion of fire gates for Maidenstone and Winfulton at the junctions with Point Hill still enables access for emergency vehicles and refuse trucks if needed. In my email to you yesterday, I quoted a number of streets in the area that have long enjoyed fire gates, which do the job of deterring dangerous cut through traffic and providing access when needed, with apparently no complaint. I'm happy to name those streets, but do not want to take up time. But I say this tonight, if it works for them, then why not for us? I ask you to support this amendment to the decision made by Councillor Lecao. I'm happy to take questions, Madam Chair, but would like to hear from the officers tonight if they have arguments against my suggestion. And with respect, I think we are entitled to hear those arguments tonight in public rather than read about them in the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Have we got Vicky McGinley, please? Hello. Um, I'm supporting the implementation of the trial scheme with reservation, but we've had years of consultations and reports about reducing traffic in Greenwich, but effectively nothing has changed. That's because the pro-car lobby protests loudly every time the council proposes a scheme, but they don't offer positive solutions to the climate emergency. As has been mentioned, we will have a problem with illegal levels of pollution caused by motor traffic also in London. Uh, it's time for leaders to step up, take action, as they have done in other European cities. For instance, Mayor of Paris, she took bold steps. She got cars off the city centre streets. She's created a great environment for locals and visitors. Like them, we need to move away from being a car-centric society. 43.1% of people, households in Greenwich, don't own a car. Some areas, it's much more than 50% who don't have cars. Um, we need to create healthier, safe streets for majority who walk and use public transport, who use wheelchairs or mobility scooters. Finally, I'd like to say I would prefer that residential streets are closed to motor vehicles all the time rather than just rush hour. I prefer physical barriers to ANPR because I was living in Maidenstone Hill. We experienced the temporary LTN back in 2020. We found the hard barriers really increased safety and we created a really lovely sense of community for adults and children on the street. But I do support the trial as a compromise because I think something must be done now. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move to members of the public who are speaking against the implementation of the decision. Um, first, I have uh, David Scales. Stand. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'll stand here because it's easier to hope you can hear me. Um, yes, I'm a, I'm a, my name is David Scales. I live in Blissett Street. I'm actually against the uh, scheme. I don't think the process by which it was decided, as has been said before, was very democratic. And as 70% objected or thereabouts, I don't really think their views are being taken into account or their suggestions for alternatives or modifications. 
um, the second reason I'm very concerned as a council tenant is the equitability of the scheme, the new scheme. Boundary roads are also residential roads. Blackheath Hill, Bristol Street, Greenwich South Street. These streets have many um, social housing residents who live there. Sorry. 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 Um, there are concerns that, um, that the displacement of traffic or the transfer of traffic from the uh, more affluent streets will um, cause problems in these streets with the build-up of traffic. Um, at the moment, it is distributed fairly evenly throughout the area. But I think during the times of the operation, the peak times, then the Blackheath Hill will come to a, probably to a virtual standstill. I would also welcome from the council the exemptions that you've put forward for the scheme. However, there could be wider exemptions, for example, I know parents who take children with neurodivergent issues to a counselling centre who would be very stressed if caught up in very heavy traffic uh, from different areas of the borough where public transport isn't very easily served to get there. We also affect people with autoimmune diseases um, and people with hidden disabilities if they are not included in the exemptions. I'm not quite clear totally about the object of the scheme. If it's to prevent cut through traffic using AMPR, that's fine. But why not give local residents an exemption who live within the scheme rather than hindering them returning to where they live? Most people who drive, just finishing, do so sparingly. They, have, they do so for essential journeys, carrying heavy shopping for elderly relatives who would not um, welcome delivery drivers necessarily, um, people with dementia, etc and also for taking people to hospitals, not just to tri a, a trip down the road to buy a newspaper, and also for housebound family members. So there are certain occasions when drivers do, people do drive, but I think do so sparingly. I think most residents who drive are considerate, and will certainly not drive every day of the week, as thank, has been alleged. Thank um, you, Mr. Scales. Thank you very much. And also, um, just um, sorry. Sorry, you've, you've gone quite I over two minutes to say now. About, yeah, sorry, I've gone over. But in fact, one North London council um, was forced sorry, to apologise after to only you. boasting that LTN reduced pollution, whereas it had increased pollution we are by 26% on you. boundary roads. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have Emily Norton, please? Yeah. Councillor, can I just make sure that the... Um, the microphones are okay because half of that I couldn't understand. It's it's not good for the residents. It's probably a, a battery in the machine that needs changing. We're using a different microphone now, so hopefully that will be better. Um, my name is Emily Norton. I'm speaking on behalf of the Westcombe Society. I'd like to make three points, please. One. The extremely high level of negative responses to the 2023 consultation has already been raised. The response rates were also high, in our opinion, very high for a consultation. The current proposals claim to have taken into account comments received, but the amendments have not been consulted on, so there is no accurate way of knowing whether they are acceptable to a significantly larger proportion of residents. Therefore, there is currently no mandate for going ahead. Section 5 of the report to this committee states that the amendments to the scheme will result in reduced benefits and a significant increase in cost to 220,000, 220, as we understand it, as quoted in Appendix A, Section 10. We cannot support this sort of expenditure on what is essentially an experiment, especially in the current financial climate. Surely it would be cheaper to consult again first. Two. We are very concerned about longer journeys and displacement of traffic into other residential areas and onto main roads, which are also residential, are already polluted and congested, especially during peak hours when traffic would displace onto them and where a higher proportion of residents probably don't have cars themselves. The report cites studies which show only small amounts of displacement, but other studies differ. Is it fair and does it meet council policy to displace traffic from our relatively peaceful residential streets, even a small amount, if the displaced traffic moves onto other residential streets that are already more polluted and congested than ours? Three. Three. 
Three, we object to the proposals, but should they go ahead, we would like assurance of continuous monitoring of the scheme, especially before it is implemented, and also, in particularly once in place, both before and after the Silvertown Tunnel opens, as we think that there may be a significant effect of the Silvertown Tunnel. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have Joe Jeffrey? Oh, sorry, uh, Val Ferguson, who's going to speak on behalf of Joe Jeffrey? Uh, good evening, I'm Val Ferguson. I represent the uh, residents of Eastcombe Avenue, which is already heavily polluted. We have the A102 at the back of us, and we also have the uh, huge transport lorries up and down all day. The pollution is absolutely unacceptable, and I'm really surprised that this Labour Council is moving traffic from a, a rich area like Westcombe Park to a, a poorer area like Charlton, and those in favour are obviously uh, very uh, pleased with themselves, but we are the ones that are going to be suffering. Right, these are the points I'd like to make. Um, the EQIs Analysis of traffic pollution and noise acknowledges potential concerns for protected groups due to increased traffic on boundary roads but lacks thorough analysis. Although there may be exemptions for blue badge holders and stakeholders on a case-by-case -case basis, the lack of detailed measures for safe navigation highlights a gap and accessibility challenges due to steep gradients are not specifically addressed. The assessment mentions impacts on elderly, pregnant people, racial minority group groups, including Boundary Road residents, where up to 80% are non-white, but lacks detailed mitigation strategies. It also discusses socioeconomic impacts, but does not detail the contrast between social housing tenants inside LTNs, 4.7, and on boundary roads, 58%. Thank you, A Ms. significant Ferguson. oversight is a lack of We're comprehensive monitoring Thank to you. evaluate, but lacks any detailed measures. Last thing, LTNs must benefit the community equitably. Thank Failure you, to address Ferguson. these points omitted from the EQI is not only unethical, Thank but also you. unlawful now under the well Traffic Management Act the Environmental we Protection need to move Act, on to the next speaker, and please. the Public Sector Equality Duty. Therefore, a comprehensive Thank independent you. review We're moving on to the next speaker now. Thank you very much. The last sentence of the EQI is requested before the commencement of the scheme. Thank you. Can we move to Alan Pike now, please? And I would ask everyone if they can please keep to time. We have a lot of speakers to get through. Is Alan Pike here, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, three quick points. Um, a lot of responses were not made on commonplace. They were sent to the Council by email and correspondence. So many responses, we were told that the Council couldn't answer them individually. But we, those of us who sent them in got a standard response saying, all responses captured as part of the consultation will be analysed appropriately and considered as part of the decision-making process. It has been confirmed to me by the Council that those responses were not analysed in the decision report. Uh, I've been told that they were taken into account, but the decision report does not analyse and give you information on the content of any of those responses at all. They're, we don't know what those people thought. I saw um, an FOI response um, dated the 7th of November 1922, which was three months before the consultation began. Uh, which was circulated within the council to various officers uh, and said that consultants had been appointed to assist in delivering the Western East Greenwich LTN brackets we're working on the title. The objective continued to, continued to tell us, objective was uh, to deliver a scheme under an experimental traffic reduction order in March, April 2023. That was three months before the first part of the consultation started. 
I've no problem, no one has any problem with consultants and officers sketching out ideas as consultations are building up, but the council can hardly be surprised that people think that there was predetermination. On a final point, Chair, I'll just draw your attention to it if the time's running out, the, the point that Councillor Greenwell raised about this myths leaflet that was circulated. I've got a lot of FOI stuff on it, which I can't give in two minutes, but let me just read one, if I may. Uh, I asked what, if any, was the involvement of elected members in either the decision to produce a response leaflet or the approval of its content, and I was told that the leader of the council and the cabinet member were involved. So it wasn't a freelance action by officers or consultants. There was political involvement in it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, can I now have Vicky Barry, please? Hi, thank you. Hi, I'm here as a member of the Char Central Charlton Residents Association. I simply do not accept the suggestion that there will be no significant displacement of traffic, um, and I would like to see the modelling that that proves to be true. It's an indisputable fact that vehicles trying to get from the upper roads to the lower roads will have no other option than to go through Charlton. The two roads that will be heavily impacted by this are Victoria Way, which has a primary school, a bus route, it's on a bus route, and it has uh, width barriers before um, the railway bridge. And the other one is Charlton Church Lane, which is heavily parked, has traffic lights, it's on a, a bus, road, bus route to Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and it's also got width barriers. I am an asthmatic, and I'm extremely worried about the effect that all this idling traffic will have on mine and other people's res respiratory health. I'm also worried that due to, due to gridlock traffic on Charlton Church Lane, Victoria Way and Eastcombe Avenue, I will effectively be trapped in my road, unable to drive in and out of Charlton. I recently conducted, along with other members of the CCRA, traffic counts on Charlton Church Lane, and in one hour, there were 500 vehicles going down and 160 going uh, up Charlton Church Lane. And that's, that's before any of this nonsense is impl implemented. These numbers demonstrate that these two roads already take an extremely heavy, heavy traffic load. <clears throat> How will this traffic flow be monitored before, during and after the ETO? And what will be done when, not if, there is an, an increase in displacement of traffic in the poorer area of Charlton? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now have Jennifer Donovan, who is going to speak for Sally Hughes and Nigel Duncan and herself. So, um, have we got Jennifer? Okay. Thank I'll you. I'll speak so, for myself first, or? Um, we, we will give you up to six minutes to speak for all three, if okay. that's okay. Okay, bear with me. My name is Jenny Donovan. I am a Greenwich Send parent full-time carer to a disabled child who attends the only school within the borough able to meet her complex needs. It is 3.2 miles from my home. Pre-LTNs, this journey which I do four times a day, five days a week during term time, averaged 14 minutes. Under the first LTN, this increased to anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half due to the lack of flow brought by the road closures and cycle lanes. Shooters Hill Road today, without the LTNs, remains congested daily, purely because of the cycle lanes and floating bus stops, all recently identified as having contributed to an increase in car use, as these render bus routes delayed, stressful and problematic. This is exacerbated by the volume of freight across the heath, which could be easily time managed. I am not alone. At the school my daughter attends, many children arrive by specialist transport from in and outside of the borough. The majority of their parents were never made aware of the proposals, never mind consulted. This then brings me on to the utterly unforgivable exclusionary element to these schemes, which render disabled children whose families have already battled hard against the system identified this week in an LGO report published as unfit for purpose to ensure their children have fair access to the education they are, like their peers, entitled to. The Royal Borough of Greenwich Exemption Scheme details those who may suffer 
distress and anxiety from extra journey times. Disabled children already struggle to access education successfully. As a parent, I cannot describe to you the monumental efforts this takes on a daily basis. So for the very council legally obliged to deliver them education to, to facilitate such a scheme is not only nonsensical, but inhumane. This applies to all those within the vulnerable category, elderly, sick, and the carers who support them. The council's proposed discretionary hardship scheme has already been commented on in the officer's report on the 8th of March decision as unworkable. I would thus encourage your borough of Greenwich to consider that they were re-elected on the premise they would serve the many, not the few. These schemes and all they stand for are contrary to this spirit and ethos and detrimental to all who live here, the most divisive scheme we have seen in our time. Thank you. Um, that's just over two minutes. I'm, I'm sorry. Could you now move on to um, okay. either Sally or Nigel, I will, please? I will now read on behalf of Nigel Duncan. I am a retired professor and live on Royal Hill. I wish to address air quality and pollution. The council's own evidence shows that the worst pollution is on the boundary roads and not within the proposed scheme areas. This is true of nitrogen dioxide emissions and both sizes of particulate pollution. It is also the boundary roads, particularly Trafalgar Road, where the majority of accidents occur. A scheme that exacerbates that situation is irrational. It is boundary road pollution that caused Ella Kissy Deborah's death. The council cites research to suggest that LTNs do not significantly increase, tra increase traffic outside their areas. I'm sorry. However, the most recent departmental report shows that this is exactly what does happen in some cases. It is likely to do so in the case of these schemes. I say this from my experience of the failed scheme in West Greenwich. I only use our car for essential journeys, preferring active travel. The council's own local implementation plan shows that this is the norm in this area, given that we have already had the, slight, the highest proportion of active travel in the borough. So my experience will be common to many. When I did use the car, I had to drive further, sit for longer in traffic, and contribute more to the car I had to drive further, sit for longer in traffic, and contribute more to pollution. This scheme will force tradespeople and delivery drivers to do the same. The scheme will therefore add to the pollution on the boundary roads, and generally, please withdraw it. Thank you. And if you could now move on to the statement by Sally Hughes. Sally Hughes now, yes. Um, apologies. Multiple. The Council's policy is that there is a step change in travel behaviour is necessary in our health and well-being. If we don't take significant action, we will not reach net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Their aim to achieve this is by punishment and coercion. Council officers have admitted that journeys around the long boundary routes will be time consuming and slow, exposing everyone to more pollution, ill health and hardship referred to within the exemption hardship policy. Council policy changes all the time but fails to mention the revenue expected from these schemes, fails to implement national policy in traffic management, guidance from government, safety or general imp implementation. Previous council policies have said an LTN will make people healthier and have linked the LTN to a reduction in childhood obesity, hospital admissions for pulmonary disease without evidence. That is a cynical deception. This area will not reduce pollution reduction even for the, minor even for the minority of residents who benefit from a small reduction in traffic. The truth being that this serves a very privileged few and not the majority who voted overwhelmingly against these proposals and schemes. The council rejects official public policy. Road traffic law generally only allows road closures on safety grounds in general. The council have provided no evidence of a lack of safety in the LTN area. The scheme will make the area less safe. It is against the mayor's transport policy and road traffic law to impede bus routes, all of which, except the 386, Bus routes on Trafalgar Road that are vital to active travel are already congested by road narrowing via the cycle lanes. The great majority of accidents referred to earlier, including those involving cyclists and pedestrians, are in fact on Blackheath Hill and Trafalgar Road, not within central Greenwich. The stats all exist. 
The Thank major shopping you. street for our neighbourhood is therefore impacted negatively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Donovan. Thank you. David Quamby, please. David Cornby, West Greenwich resident, former board member of TfL and the director of Colin Buchanan Transport Consultants. The plan called in has camera barriers on weekdays for the two peak periods to deter through traffic, as we all know. How far should these be used also to coerce local residents to do more working, walking, cycling and bus and public transport travel Taken, taken among all those covering a wide variety of conditions and circumstances. Greenwich Borough already scores highly on active travel compared with other boroughs. How effective are these measures at changing travel behavior? A recent Lambeth study of four LTNs showed resident driver trips reducing only 6%, leaving 94% still choosing to endure the LTN's inconveniences, adding to boundary road traffic already congested to complete their circuitous journeys. Whatever the comparatives with other areas, within our area, the several steep hills, only two of which are served by buses, were recognized even in PJA consultants' report, quote, likely to be a key barrier for people to walk and cycle, close quotes. Going ahead could generate little behavior change and a massive inconvenience to a wide range of people as we are hearing today. How fair is the plan? I suggest that among other factors, it discriminates against residents, some carrying tools and materials, who must use a car or van to reach dispersed workplaces not reachable by public transport. Building sites, manufacturing businesses are scattered across South London. The cabinet member Thank considered option three. Thank you, Mr. Cornby. We're at I'll time. I'll be very quick. Allowing residents to buy 100 pound permits to pass camera barriers unrestricted, which was dismissed as inequitable. At a stroke, this and other problems could disappear by issuing annual permits to residents and local businesses at merely a small you, administrative Mr. charge. Thank you, Mr. Cornby. Thank you. I now have Clay Gregory speaking on behalf of Jane Gregory. Hi, I'm speaking on behalf of Jane Gregory. I'm actually speaking on behalf, um, speaking for the uh, implementation of the traffic scheme. So Jane's words are, I live in West Greenwich and speak against the call-in recommendation that there should be another wider consultation. Only a quarter of the respondents to the West Greenwich schemes lived in the West Greenwich area. Given that 70% of West Greenwich residents wanted the experimental LTN to remain, it seems that the overwhelming majority of those objecting to the schemes for West Greenwich do not actually live there. This is important because local residents know what happens there all day, every day. They know where they are forced to walk on the road because pavements are too narrow or non-existent. They know where roads are so narrow that vehicles have to mount the pavement to get through. They see and hear through traffic speeding to jump the queue on Blackheath Hill. They watch those same vehicles worsen that queue by pushing into the stream of traffic. They experience the near misses, witness the accidents, hear the foul language, and have dealt with dead and injured pets. A wider consultation will lead to even more people who don't know the area expressing a view on what should happen. An enlarged consultation area in 2021 led to the decision to remove the West Greenwich scheme, but the independent data showed that the scheme was a success. People living in the area wanted it to remain, but in the words of the decision, there was a perception that it was creating traffic problems in East Greenwich, a perception that proved to be unfounded when the West Greenwich scheme was removed. The council has to move forward 
implement the priorities agreed with residents across the borough and use local knowledge and experience to get it right. We don't need more and bigger consultations. We need action. I ask the committee to reject this call-in recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now have Sarah Garrett. Um, firstly, it's uh, a fallacy that um, this scheme will reduce carbon emissions in the borough. And also, just to point out, just because it worked in Waltham Forest doesn't mean it will work here. We have a completely different typography. For the last 35 years, I have lived in West Greenwich and in East Greenwich, and I've been running a business here. I attend I've attended all the previous meetings for the previous LTNs a few years ago, held by a different set of council staff. Thankfully, the council then saw the results of the displaced traffic and pollution and discontinued the scheme. It is scientific fact that the idling engines of static vehicles in a jam produce more pollutants than free-flowing vehicles. They are, of course, on the road for longer too. By closing side roads in rush hour, we will be adding to the already jammed main roads, e.g. Trafalgar Road and Woolwich Road, which have already had their capacity halved by the new cycle lanes. These roads are used by many, many people, especially pedestrians, to reach schools, libraries, swimming pools, and shops, etc. Adding to the emissions on these major roads directly contradicts the Greenwich Carbon Neutral Plan and aspirations to reduce asthma and lung disease. My concern is repollution data. Um, how are the council planning to measure CO2 and other pollutants before the trial? How long for? Are we talking a year? Are they already measuring them? Where are they measuring them? Who are they instructing to measure them? We haven't been told any of this at any of the consultation meetings. I've seen previous data quoted on vehicle counts. This can be misleading. E.g., 20 vehicles passing through Mays Hill in one hour sounds low but not when you know they are 20 static vehicles in gridlock, gridlock, not going anywhere. Thank you. My journeys will quadruple in time and distance, and I will be forced to use more fossil fuels. I always use public transport wherever I can. Thank Sometimes you very the buck is Thank passed you very to much. TfL, now at time. but the air, Thank you. air above us in Greenwich is shared Thank you, Ms. Mrs. Ms. as our carbon emissions. With the Silvertown Tunnel, we'll be getting even more carbon emissions. Thank you. And this experiment is experimenting on local people's health, welfare, and businesses. Thank you. Um, I now have David Ballantyne. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my wife, who cannot be here through breathing difficulties, and at home she's not well. We live in Greenwich South Street. We live in Greenwich South Street at the narrower south end, where the volume of traffic greatly increased during the 2022 unfair LTN scheme. We now object to the 2024 scheme as follows. Flawed consultation prevented us from commenting on our own road. Residential boundary roads were not included. These are where the traffic would be rerouted, of course. Misleading definition of boundary versus residential roads, Greenwich South Street and Blackheath Hill, etc., etc., are, of course, themselves residential. No data was produced to show the numbers of residents in the boundary roads compared to the LTN roads, but the residential density on them is much higher with their flats and their denser housing. Many more residents live in boundary roads than in the dainty semi-detached land. 
Boundary roads such as South Street would be congested with dispersed traffic, delaying the buses. Traffic does not go away, but more miles are forced to be driven instead. Restricting one area has a knock-on effect on others, e.g. Charlton, Deptford, other parts of Greenwich, and of course Lewisham. The delayed traffic queuing on South Street will cause increased pollution, both of air and noise, as happened previously, obviously detrimental to all our healths. The impact will be on essential services, including tradespeople, health workers, emergencies services, school journeys, Buses will be delayed by the additional traffic, especially in rush hours on the, quote, boundary roads. Thank you, Mr. We Valentine. have to express our indignation to the threat to our living conditions and health. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I now have Alex McIntosh, please? Thank you. Um, I'd love to be coerced into running up hills, but, you know, I'm temporarily uh, not be good at it. Let me give me notes out. Um, also, I might mention in passing, I live in Langton Way, but don't worry. I know you screwed up. I know you put it in it by accident, and no doubt you've debited your consultant's fee accordingly. So um, let's move on to the real substance. Um, I was really intrigued by the way the detailed 200-page odd report, which unusually I've read, dismissed the government guidelines. Okay, I accept that they're not in yet. But I love the idea that you can simply ignore and spend seven pages debunking a set of guidelines that say you shouldn't impose anything. 79% um, of my neighbours don't really go with it. And so I'm intrigued that the government guidelines suggests objective polling as a fairly legitimate way to determine impact. Nobody's mentioned objective polling tonight. I wonder why not. Uh, the council approach, unfortunately reinforced by tonight's performance, at worst looks undemocratic and at best looks arrogant. Um, I really believe in participative democracy, and I'm lucky and old enough to have been involved in probably about 30 national and local elections since turning 18. Um, voted Labour in all of them as well. But I've also contributed to 20 council consultations in the past couple of years via Commonplace. I'm beginning to wonder if I'm wasting my time. Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. And now I have Peter Conway, please. Thank you. My name is Peter Conway, and I reside at 64 Santoff Road, Charlton. I'm a member of the West Charlton Residents Association. The Residents Association is not anti the concept of the LTN, but is against the boundary roads of the proposed LTN Eastern Avenue, Wincliffe Road, and Victoria Way becoming a high-traffic neighbourhood, shifting traffic from one part of Greenwich to Charlton. These three roads and others will form the main access points between Charlton Road and the lower A206. Unlike your officers, we have been monitoring traffic using cameras on these three roads after the last few months. Approximately 2,000 vehicles are currently using Eastcombe Avenue both ways each day, with many cars traveling significantly over the 20 mile per hour limit. At the junction of Eastcombe Avenue and Victoria Way, due to legal parking on both sides of the street, the traffic is reduced to a single lane, uh, often causing gridlock and delays to the 380 bus. This will only be exacerbated with the introduction of the LTN. Additionally, the railway bridge over Victoria Way is another single lane pinch point, already currently causing tailbacks in both directions at peak times. 
Carbon emissions are on the increase around Faustine School, and if traffic increases by the expected 20%, the impact on children's health and safety will clearly increase. So my question, has the council consulted Faustine School or the other schools in the area or London Transport or the emergency services? For the reasons I have outlined, we thus urge you to rethink your approach to the LTN. Thank you. Um, that was the final public speaker I had on my list. Was anyone expecting to speak who hasn't spoken? Anyone registered who hasn't? Can I, you give your name, please, and I'll check if you're on the list. Yes, I have Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Gorski. I am a resident on Mayhill Road, SE7. I also work with Peter as a representative of the Charlton Residents Association. Before I say anything else, this has already been covered, but I do want to highlight that I personally am really pro the net zero target, fully supportive of that. Um, and as a community, West Charlton residents are not against low traffic initiatives. We've heard a lot tonight about public health. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I think I can say with some confidence we're all also pro-public health, but that does apply to the public en masse and not just the selected view that will be impacted positively by what's being recommended. What we are against is being completely ignored, particularly when us being ignored will lead to the implementation of what we perceive to be an ill-thought-through, patched-up um, scheme that has, stands to impact the quality of life and the health of many people in the Boundary Roads. Um, not only for residents in Charlton with their families, but also for the many people that use the schools, the nurseries, etc., that are in those boundary roads that also stand to be impacted, where safety is also a concern. The overwhelmingly ne negative response to the consultation, as well as the volume of calling emails that have got us here tonight, demonstrates that people, this is important to people, people don't feel that their interests are being taken care of, and we don't feel that the solution that's proposed is inclusive or stands to benefit everybody in the community. And frankly, that's your job. It's not your job to do something. I, I empathise fully with, you know, the gentleman who's young children and everyone who's talked about respiratory issues. But we, in the Charlton Slopes, bear our burden of this same issue. We have the re we're access for the retail park. People already use us as cut through. It is a, 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 a what's sorry, what's a regional problem, a, a broad issue, and we bear a very heavy share of that burden. So my ask is that you don't just push forward with something because it's what started and under these banners of, you know, net zero, etc. You have a full community to think about. And my ask is that you do that. Thank you. <laughs> Did I see someone else who thought they registered? What's your name, please, sir? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. We see with our own eyes the almost unbroken stream of traffic on Blackheath Hill, where I also live. The situation is made worse under the previous scheme and will always be made worse by any traffic scheme that doesn't place the boundary roads and surrounding streets at the heart of any traffic survey. There are in excess of 1,000 residences units along Blackheath Hill, encompassing a high percentage of social housing as well as private renting and owner occupiers, and a sizable hospital for patients with neurological and brain injury. The, owners the ownership is extremely low of cars along this road. They can't afford them. The previous experiments made by the Greenwich Council on some of its residents was distressing, which also included the diagnosis of Melanie's husband with late onset asthma. The Black Blain Injury Unit physio staff also regularly walk patients along Blackheath Hill for rehab. Many suffer with serious pulmonary issues, as do a growing percentage of young children under the age of 12 living on Parkside, where there is a whole block designated to people of all age with chronic health issues. Um, so what we're asking is 
what somebody mentioned about people having more exercise and walking, I'd also add that a number of the youngsters that live on Parkside walk to school up Blackheath Hill to John Ball and to the St. Teresa's School on the other side of the road. I don't think that's going to promote their health. The greater majority of residents on Blackheath Hill actually did vote against the introduction of the LTN in 2022, and now obviously are even more adamant that an introduction of a much enlarged LTN will actually bring no or little benefit to any of the residents there. Thank it you. Will, uh, all right. Thank you. You're now at time. Thank you very much. Can I just say one, it's one last thing though, which I think is important. Any gains in reducing pollution on Blackheath Hill through ULES will be cancelled out if these proposals are adopted due to impact of displaced traffic onto our road. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the gentleman behind, can I have your name please? Yes, I have you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, I'm part of the Gloucester Circus Garden Committee and we've pulled together the views of residents of Gloucester Circus into a presentation which has been sent to the committee members about the original proposals for the ETO to remove the bollards on Gloucester Circus and reopen it to two-way traffic. Uh, we are pleased to see that the latest report from Councillor Lacau and the transport officers are advising that those bollards now remain and the traffic will not flow through. By way of background, this section of Gloucester Circus leading to Crooms Hill was closed in 2016 due to high volumes of through, cut through traffic and for major concerns for pedestrian safety after some very close shaves. Um, this section of the road is very narrow. It's not wide enough for two vehicles to pass. And in addition, there's no pavement upon part of it so pedestrians have to walk in the road. Um, if the road was reopened, then oncoming vehicles would need to mount the pavement to pass. This obviously represents a risk to pedestrians, of whom there are many. We did a pedestrian survey back in April, which showed more than 2,000 pedestrians per day use that road to go to and from Greenwich Park on an average weekend and 1,700 on an average weekday, including many school children. Um, that suggests more than 650,000 ped pedestrians per year use that road. So in summary, we would like strongly support the retention of the traffic bollards to protect, to, to protect the pedestrians and both during the trial scheme and afterwards when the final traffic management plan is implemented. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, I didn't, did I see another hand? Sorry. Can you give your name, please? Sp speaking for James Kellogg. I'm afraid James didn't register. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd now like to ask the cabinet member to respond to any points that she wishes to do so. Um, thank you, Chair. And I'd first like to apologize for um, having to disappear periodically um, during this, it's an um, unfortunate uh, response to some medication I'm on, so um, my apologies. Um, I think a lot of what's been said had been covered earlier on in the um, previous reports um, and the previous comments that were, were made. Um, I think there are a couple of things that the officers would like to pick up on, and um, so I'm going to pass it over to them. To, 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 to take that on. Yeah, sorry, I haven't talked for a little while, so I need to get a drink, two seconds. I just think really the, the main points, um, obviously we heard from residents of Maiden Stone here when we fought in Fortin Street. 
um, and we have tried to produce information regarding the AMP closures in the report. Um, obviously, it's up to the panel to consider that response. Um, also, there was quite a lot of discussion around exemptions, individual circumstances, and um, I just wanted to reinforce the fact that, that we, we obviously have extended the exemptions that are available to individual circumstances as well, which we'll work through and give information, oh, sorry, work through and give information on um, in regards to how to apply for those and um, how to set up that system at a later point. Um, anything else I've picked up during that? No, I mean, obviously, if there's anything that you want to come back on, then I can answer in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of points that were raised by members of the public that I'd like a little bit of clarity on. Um, a lot of members have mentioned the boundary roads, and so I'd like to understand a little bit more about the modelling you've done in terms of displaced traffic on boundary roads and how you're going to take, if the experimental traffic order goes ahead, how you're going to take um, the data into account when making decisions about whether or not to make it permanent. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? So on top of the monitoring strategy package that we'll be rolling out while also liaising with TfL as Trafalgar Road, the boundary roads there uh, is their asset. So the scheme that they introduced along Trafalgar Road, Willage Road belongs to them. Uh, we're in constant communication with TfL and they've been made aware of our proposals. Should it go ahead, they'll be carrying out monitoring on our behalf for their assets and sharing it with us as we carry out our monitoring on our side, which includes, as we've covered before, uh, ATCs, bus monitoring, everything along those lines. So there will be an examination around not just the project area, but on those boundary roads itself as well. Sure. Uh, just also covering Charlton as well. So we're not forgetting about Charlton. Charlton has not been left off the map. Um, it is going to be covered and reviewed as well. And how that impacts, so what the West and East Greenwich does within the surrounding area. From our monitoring so far, we can see that there's more of a, a traveling from the east to west in the AM peaks. So it's something that we are aware of and uh, we'll be carrying out a level of monitoring within that area. So as it were, just, just as um, highlight what Councillor Cow has said previously, is we have to start somewhere. And you know, wherever we start, we will be looking at the surrounding area. So for now we are looking at the west and east Greenwich area but also keeping an eye on the Charlton area as well. Black. Sorry, I'd just like to add on Blackheath. Thank you. Um, I've just got one more and then I'll, I'll pass over. Thank you, Councillor Greenwell. Um, a resident, uh, Mr. Pike, mentioned the responses that were sent to the council. Can you confirm that they were taken into account as well as the responses um, on commonplace. Yes, uh, I believe it was regarding the recent FOI asking if email correspondences had been considered. We did respond. Was it not that one, no? It, I don't think it was to do with the, the, the FOI, but the amount of residents who emailed the council expressing yes. their objections as well as the ones who used the portal, yes. were the emails also taken to, into account? Their emails were taken into account. It was actually provided in the report as well. Uh, state in those figures and how it affected or how it shaped the proposal. So it's in, it's in the responses, yes. Thank you. Councillor Greenwell, you had a question? Yes. Um, it's, it's, uh, one of the um, residents asked the question about um, what is a parent of a, of a disabled child and the consultations didn't go or did it go of the consultation to send pupils to send schools to hospitals to other schools uh, on the borders? Did the consultation go so far? Public. Sorry, I'm not aware of any hospital in the immediate border. Uh, it, I'm referring to one particular school where there are send children. So all the schools within the project areas were consulted on. We actually reached out to the schools for engagement as well. So it was down to them if they wanted to engage with us and provide feedback uh, to the consultation. Thank you. Um, there's no further questions. Would the um, 
the councillors who brought the call-ins like to make any additional comments before we make a determination? Councillor Hartley? Thank you, Chair. Um, without meaning to prolong the evening, I would just, first of all, just like to thank all the residents who came along and spoke, whether they were for or against. Um, but haven't, I would just perhaps leave the Cabinet member with this final thought. Has, hasn't what we've heard tonight demonstrated that actually, you know, that this remains so contentious um, and there is such a lack of confidence in the consultation process that has got us to this uh, part. I, I just don't understand what's to be lost by consulting specifically on the amended option A. And I know you're going to deliberate. I really would appeal to the panel to send this decision back to the cabinet member with a recommendation that they consult specifically on amended option A um, so that um, public support for that can be tested because people have spoke, spoken really powerfully um, both in support and in opposition to the scheme and I, you know, on Tuesday of this week, yesterday, the council published its community engagement pledge, a big long document, 33 pages about how important it is to engage with the community and here we are on Wednesday and, you know, this is, community engagement is not, has not gone well in this example and I think there's a chance, there's a chance to fix it. <clears throat> there's, there's a, there's a chance to fix that tonight uh, to avoid history from repeating itself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does the cabinet member have any more comments before we uh, adjourn to make a deliberation? Um, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. We're now gonna adjourn to consider all the representations that have been made and deliberate. You're free to wait into this room when we return together with our comments. We have decided to refer the decision back to the cabinet member, and we ask that she takes into account the following comments in reconsidering the decision of the 29th of February. Firstly, in light of comments raised tonight, to ensure that she is satisfied about the adequacy of consultation that has taken place, and that she's satisfied about the adequacy of consultation that will take place if the experimental order is implemented. Secondly, to consider the amendments proposed by the officers in the call-in report. Thirdly, to reflect on the comments made about specific roads tonight. And finally, if the experimental order goes ahead, to ensure that there are adequate arrangements in place for monitoring impact, in particular for those boundary roads and the neighboring areas. Um, that concludes our decision. I just wanna thank you all again for your time tonight. It's been a long evening. So thank you all very much for your contributions. Thank you.